now is being recorded. Yes, you're, record, you're recording, you're recording this meeting. Be sure to let everyone know that the, they are being recorded. Uh, of course, you know that you guys are all being recorded. Uh, OK, so you, so you guys can see uh, chapter two. It's Christopher Marlowe and uh, Dr. Faustus. And of course, you know from last time that Dr. Faustus is the um, creation, is the work, and Christopher Marlowe is uh, the, the author or uh, the writer of Dr. Faustus. I'm sure you're familiar with uh, the two of them by now. Um, if you have done any reading about the same, I would like you to uh, perhaps uh, tell me how many have you uh, done some reading on Christopher Marlowe? How many ha uh, of you have um, yeah, perhaps skim, skim through the book, the chapter. Not I so many. Uh, okay. Who else? Mm -hmm. So, uh, Mahmoud, I think Mahmoud is raising his hand. Uh, who else? Yeah, uh, the mic is Jana. The mic is. Jana, mute your mic. Okay. So, um, again, lots of people. Anas is raising his hand. And, uh, okay. So, how? let me uh, ask you this question in a different way. Let me ask you about, uh, when I say Christopher Mar uh, Marlowe, does the name ring any bells at the back of your minds? What? Are the yes, associations of the name? Okay, come to the mic and say something. What's your name? My name is My name is Rana Jar. Uh, okay. Christopher Marlowe. He's a writer. Uh, mm. Beer. He uh, love his uh, works. Um, mm. uh, he wrote about uh, a figure or uh, uh, Doctor uh, Doctor Faustus. And uh, uh, Dr. Fautis, uh, he looked for uh, uh, more knowledge and he make a contract with the evil, devil, to give him uh, more knowledge for 24 years. Is it only knowledge that he was asking for? Uh, no, more than no knowledge and... Um, so it's, it's uh, knowledge, that power, pleasure. Uh, power, pleasure, yes, everything. And uh, it, it's for 24 years. Mm -hmm. Good. Thank you, uh, Rola. Thank you so much. Um, can, can, can we have somebody else? OK, Christopher Marlu, Dr. Faustus. OK, yes. sure. Um, uh, OK, yeah, go ahead. What's your name? Marlo or the summarize of uh, Dr. Faustus? I mean, what comes to your mind? I mean, whatever comes to your mind, it's okay. We're open. Um, well, all I know about Christopher Marlo is that he was an English playwriter, a poet, and a translator of the Elizabethan era. Uh, mm -hmm. He was kind of known to push the limits, and he challenged the religious status quo and the social norm. Uh, are you reading or something, Adana? No, no, Adana, no. Are you just a book. <laughs> <laughs> so I won't forget. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's okay. Go on. Uh, I enjoy it. I mean, um, mashallah, your English is excellent. Are you done or something? No. Um, <laughs> this guy sounds like, uh, like what I don't, I do know about Dr. Faustus. Oh. Uh, it's about uh, like he was known to be a well-respected scholar uh, who grows dissatisfied with the limit of traditional form of knowledge, and he decided that he wants to learn to practice um, magic and necromancy. Ah, yeah, interesting. Thank you, Dana. Thank you so much. Excellent, excellent insights that you guys are sharing and giving. Um, um, actually, I don't know what what more would I add. I mean, but that's okay. I, I'll somehow manage. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, so our friend Dr. Faustus and um, his creator Christopher Marlowe. Uh, of course, um, uh, it wouldn't be enough to talk about Christopher Marlowe uh, and Dr. Faustus without providing in the, the the relevant context. And the context, I mean, the time. And the place. Of course, you know that Christopher Marlowe is not um, 
Egyptian or Roman. Remember, we, we've been talking about Egyptians and Romans for quite some time. So Christopher Marlowe happens to be different. He is um, English and he is Elizabethan. Elizabethan means that he belongs to the Elizabethan age. And the Elizabethan age is this period in um, English history uh, where uh, Queen Elizabeth uh, I was ruling. And uh, this was also uh, a part of what we call the early modern period. Uh, this comes um, during and perhaps um, a little after the Renaissance, and the Renaissance, like we uh, said, is a period that is full of uh, artistic and literary patronage. Uh, patronage means that you have patrons or you have people who sponsor uh, the arts and the artists. Um, so it is during this time that uh, people like Christopher Marlowe and Shakespeare were operating. Uh, there was again a great deal of encouragement of the arts and arts, uh, the arts and literature were uh, being promoted because um, uh, there is a, you know, a very good reason why we're, we have this uh, support and encouragement of the arts and literature because you know you're talking about a time when people were not very well educated. Um, so the, the, the government would um, would want to perhaps uh, give messages to the people uh, and guidelines as how people should behave themselves politically, religiously and otherwise, culturally. So uh, how can you do that if you have uh, um, the majority of population unable to, to read and write? So the, the, the stage and the theatre would be uh, suitable and appropriate for that. So it, it can be a good platform through which the sponsored artists and the sponsored uh, literary figures uh, would um, write works of art that would uh, uh, reflect the, uh, the vision and the, um, the vision of, of of the government. I'm not. I'm. I'm. I'm you know, don't take it uh, to mean that it's. It was very direct. Like I'm. I'm trying to imply. It wasn't that direct. But like I always say, if I fund you, if I sponsor you, if I give you money, I would be thankful and grateful. Uh, and if you happen to be uh, a writer uh, and you're writing plays and. Uh, other uh, Victor? Le uh, just let me finish please the, the screen is not shared with us uh, be, be, uh, the the screen is not shared but i'm not using the screen yet but let me share it so that you is it now shared can you see it now yes. Yeah, yeah, oh okay yes, so again, I was talking about the age and the time in which Christopher Marlowe was operating. And I, uh, and I was saying that this time was, there was a great deal of, um, you know, literary and intellectual uh, activity uh, where uh, people were uh, kind of, uh, uh, no, they would go to the theater and uh, enjoy the uh, the plays there and get the messages that are being communicated to them. Again, there is more to the Renaissance and the Elizabethan age than just uh, drama and theater. There, there were other uh, intellectual endeavors. Uh, we're talking about the time where or when there was a, a great deal of scientific discovery a great deal of, um, you know, geographical uh, explorations. Uh, it was during this time or a little after that America will would be discovered and the new world uh, and stuff like that. So uh, and the reason why I'm, I'm, I'm giving this background because it's going to affect both Christopher Marlowe and uh, Dr. Faustus. Uh, Christopher Marlowe and Dr. Faustus have a great deal in common. The two um, have a great deal of battles and correspondence. 
uh, sometimes you forget. If you're talking about Christopher Marlowe, you forget uh, um, that you're talking about Christopher Marlowe uh, and you think that you're talking about Dr. Faustus and the other way around. So when we do Faustus, you'll see that there is a great deal of parallels between uh, Faustus and Christopher Marlowe himself. Uh, the two of them, that creator, Christopher Marlowe, and that creation, uh, Dr. Faustus, are inspired by whatever was happening at the time. Whatever was happening at the time was more uh, or less like a revolution, or actually a number of revolutions, uh, scientific revolutions, geographical revolutions, and also cultural and artistic um, revolutions. Okay, so uh, if Christopher Marlowe is operating at the time, um, I think he would be uh, influenced by whatever is happening. Uh, and talented as he is, he would, um, you know, perhaps um, uh, take advantage of this uh, climate of ideas, of this uh, atmosphere of, you know, um, advancement, whether this advancement uh, and progress is in the sciences or in the arts. Uh, of course, you know that he uh, was um, talented in literature. He, he used to write uh, poetry and drama. Um, and he was, uh, he, he has shown, or he, sh I mean, he had shown, you know, um, you know, promise and talent uh, to the extent that he had, he was given a scholarship to study um, at, uh, was it Oxford? I think it was Oxford University. Um, what, what's the big deal? I mean, lots of people join Oxford University. Well, not at the time. Like I said, I mean, education was very limited and inaccessible. So for somebody to earn a scholarship in um, Cambridge or uh, Oxford was a big deal. Especially when you also get to know that he was, uh, he comes from a poor family. So, if you come from a poor family, so your your family won't be able to support you financially. Um, again, but because of his talent, because of his exceptional abilities, he uh, earned and secured the scholarship that we're talking about. So, what does this tell us about Christopher Marlowe? It tells us a great deal. It tells us that we are in, in the spectacle of um, an exceptional talent. And um, very interesting, if you have an exceptional talent, you uh, expect uh, um, the one who has this talent to sustain it until he dies. Um, did this happen? The, do, do we see Christopher Marlowe at the age of 60 or 70, perhaps, like Shakespeare? No. No. Uh, unfortunately, he did uh, 29 year, 29 uh, year old. Yeah, which is um, very uh, strange. I mean, uh, people die. I mean, you have people who die uh, that early, but you know, you're not talking about the majority of people, right? Um, yes. You, you, you're talking about people who normally um, die at perhaps 50 or 60, but not at 30. So uh, did he die um, a natural death? Was it natural? No, no it was, he killed. You know, yeah, he got... No. Uh, let me finish, let me finish and I'll, I'll, I'll give you the opportunity to uh, perhaps comment and say whatever you have in mind. I know you like him, you have done him, perhaps you have read him. Uh, he's exceptional and his uh, biography is equally exceptional and I can understand the reaction. Um, again, we're, we're talking about him, uh, this exceptional talent who uh, dies at the age of 29. And perhaps this is the reason why uh, we're, we're, we're featuring him and not featuring um, um, Shakespeare. Uh, Shakespeare is even more talented, but we're not having him because, uh, you know, the book is about contested talents. Uh, the book is about disputed reputations. And Christopher Marlowe would fit into this uh, 
you know, image. The fact that he was exceptionally talented, but uh, um, he uh, he would have uh, issues and problems in his lifetime, and he would end up being killed at the age of 25, uh, 29. Um, again, like I said, um, it's not only Christopher Marlowe that we're doing. We're doing one of his best creations, one of his best plays, uh, Dr. Faustus. Uh, of course, he did a number of other uh, uh, plays, but the, the reason why we're uh, featuring Dr. Faustus and not the other plays uh, is uh, simply because of the parallels. Uh, because of the correspondence and the similarities that we have between the two, Christopher Marlowe and Dr. Faustus. Uh, okay, so uh, Christopher Marlowe, uh, we'll, we're, we're going to engage in a bit of uh, perhaps uh, um, biography about him, and then we'll move on to Dr. Faustus uh, and talk about Dr. Faustus as a play. Uh, and as a play written in the uh, early modern period in the Elizabethan age. And of course, we're going to set the play against its time and its background. Uh, while talking about Dr. Faustus, we'll also talk about the idea of tragedy. Uh, tragedy, uh, and I don't mean the literal meaning of the word tragedy not the first um, dictionary entry. If I ask you to, to kind of look the word up in the dictionary, the first meaning would be that tragedy is about suffering and agony. And there is, of course, a measure of suffering and agony uh, to tragedies, but we're not talking about tragedy, uh, a tragedy as a meaning. We're talking about a technical idea, about a concept, the concept of tragedy. Uh, uh, we're talking about it as a genre. Genre is a literary type. So we have tragedies, we have play, uh, we have comedies. Okay, so the genre would be play, and under play you would have a tragedy or a comedy. So uh, tragedy would mean that you have a play that has certain elements and characteristics. We'll talk about uh, them uh, together. Um, and then we're going to also uh, engage in a bit of analysis. We'll do uh, samples of the play. Uh, I, I mean, Dr. Faustus will have, we're going to do some close reading of certain, uh, you know, uh, lines from the play. Uh, and those lines were chosen very carefully because they reflect uh, the character of both Christopher Marlowe and uh, Dr. Faustus. Um, so it's technical that we're getting into. And, and then towards the end, we'll go back to the original idea of whether um, the play that we're having is a tragedy or a morality play. We'll talk about what a morality play is and what a tragedy is, and then we try to apply whatever we know about the play um, and see whether it is more of a morality play and less of a tragedy or more of a tragedy and less of a morality play. Um, and we'll end this part with, um, I mean, talking about the author, Dr. Uh, uh, Christopher Marlowe and, uh, and his hero or his protagonist uh, and how far they are similar or perhaps different, and why? And that would be the end of our endeavors uh, in this uh, second chapter. So do we have objectives that we're trying to meet? Do you have questions so far? If you would like to ask questions before I proceed, go ahead. No, doctor, thank you. OK, good. No, doctor. doctor, I cannot see anything. I don't know oh. why. Uh, perhaps you need um, you need glasses. <laughs> uh, but I mean, let let me ask the other um, uh, people. Yeah, sir, she uh, needs to refresh her page. 
yeah, refresh. Uh, yeah, um, which means I that do. Uh, I do okay. that, but uh, mm. somehow it doesn't. Uh, nothing appears, right? Um, yeah. Does this apply to um, everyone? Do you, can you can you guys see what? Um, yeah, I, yeah, I, I, I can I see. Can yeah. see. Yes, okay. yeah, I can see. All right, but can I ask you a favor? Can you go out and come back? Perhaps that would solve the, the problem. Can you try that? What's your name? OK, uh, I think she went already. OK, so uh, what are some of the aims? So you're going to provide you with practice in close reading. And like we said, uh, close reading means that we're going to give you perhaps uh, um, a piece of the play that it can be uh, a number of lines and they are taken from the play and we're going to uh, ask you to comment on them this is called close reading and close in the sense that you come closer than ever uh, to the text and uh, uh, close reading has uh, techniques and ways as how you can do that we'll, we'll talk about that um, uh, so this is uh, about how to analyze a passage from the play. This is the simplest definition of uh, of close reading. Uh, close reading. Uh, we'll also uh, encourage you to think about genre, and I like I said that genre is a literary style. Um, when I talk about plays, so uh, plays would be the big uh, the genre, and then under uh, under plays you have. Um, uh, perhaps smaller or, or subgenres like uh, um, tragedy, comedy, romantic comedy, uh, comedy of manners, and so on and so forth. Okay, and then we move on to the theme or themes that the play has, and also from your experience and perhaps um, you know other courses, you know what a theme is. Um, and a theme would be the dominant idea, the idea that the writer is trying to communicate uh, to us. He doesn't, of course, communicate it in a direct way. He doesn't uh, come uh, uh, off the page and say the theme in this play is vaulting ambition, for example, or the theme in this play would be going beyond your limits. You feel that while reading you see this is repeated in the actions of the characters in what they say so you come up you try to put the pieces together uh, it's like a puzzle and you're trying to piece the different pieces together and you come up with the idea so the main idea that you come out with would be the theme or the themes that the writer is trying to communicate to us uh, again, we'll, we'll, we'll deal with the play historically. We're going to read it against its uh, historical period. Like I said, it's, um, this is a Renaissance uh, uh, product and it has to be affected and influenced by whatever happens uh, uh, during the Renaissance. Uh, and the, the, the character of Dr. Faustus um, uh, Dr. Faustus himself is a product or a byproduct of the Renaissance or the Renaissance, as we're going to see. Again, we're going to also engage in a bit of bio biography. We'll, we'll see the uh, biography of, uh, you know, Christopher Marlowe, and we're going to kind of relate the two biographies, that of Christopher Marlowe and that of Dr. Faustus. Okay. Doctor? Yes. Uh, the screen is not showing here. Uh, okay. I try to log in again. Uh, are you the one? Uh, did you go out and come no. back? You're no. a different person. Yeah. Uh, let, let me let me perhaps do it. You one. Not shown even your even my what? Picture. Okay. Even let your picture. Yeah. Sorry. Yes, okay. Mm, I think you can see now, right? No, it's black. Very strange. Um, yeah, I will log on again, okay? I'll yeah. Yes, no. black. So, uh, is it black for everyone? Yes. No, no, yes. doctor, I, I can't see. No, no, it's, it's working for us. It is a start with I introduction. Uh, yes, that, that's, uh, that's true. So, uh, whoever is having issues, uh, please uh, go out and come back and we'll wait for you. Okay? 
Uh, I think we're not too many. I mean, most of us can see the screen. So again, uh, we, we don't want to lose sight of the big idea. The big idea, whether we're talking about Christopher Marlowe or uh, Kilio Batra, would be the idea of reputation and how reputation is earned. Uh, and we made this distinction uh, between reputation um, as a, a good thing and reputation as a bad thing. Uh, I think remember when we spoke about um, the word famous and the word infamous. Um, in, in, in both cases, you are famous, but you can be for, uh, famous in a positive way and you can also be famous in a negative way. Uh, again, most of the people that we're dealing with have this measure of infamy to them. The fact that uh, uh, they, they don't have um, undivided uh, agreement on, on their character. There is a great deal of dispute over their personalities and characters. And, uh, you have people who uh, love them, and you also have people who uh, nurse hatred uh, towards them. Um, Christopher Marlowe happens to also be uh, one of those people with disputed and contested reputation. You will have people who denigrate him. Denigrate means that they attack him. They fight. They find faults with every uh, move uh, he makes. And you'll also have people who believe that he was exceptional, and the fact that he uh, he doesn't deserve the the bad reputation that he uh, earned over the years. So it's both sides that we're dealing with everyone. Um, so again, we're talking about the idea of reputation in relation to a literary text. And the literary text that we have is Dr. Faustus by, by Christopher Marlowe, which was written between 1588 and 1592. <clears throat> um, so again, uh, Dr. Faustus would be a representation of, um, you know, what, whatever was happening at the time and also would be uh, a reflection and uh, perhaps a mirror of uh, the character of uh, Christopher Marlowe himself. Again, uh, Dr. Faustus happens to be one of Marlowe's best uh, known plays. And again, uh, if it's not, if it's only one of those best plays, it means that we have other uh, very good plays, and um, why why would the focus be on Dr. Faust? Again, it's because of the similarities that we have between the two characters, and the character of Dr. Faustus and the character of uh, Dr. Marlowe. In what sense are they similar? They are similar in, uh, um, in, in their uh, perhaps upbringing, the fact that uh, the two of them came from uh, uh, poor families, uh, the fact that they were ambitious, uh, the fact that they were exceptional, the fact that they were and they had talents and they were exceptional. But somehow uh, um, this talent uh, would be misused by them. They would abuse their talents. And the next thing you know is that um, their life uh, would take a turn for the worse. Uh, in the case of Marlow, who would be stabbed to death uh, at the age of 29, and in the case of Dr. Faustus, he would end up having a pact with the devil, um, and he would be thrown into hell uh, at the end. So, Christopher Marlow. Uh, this is a reference. There was a, a play. Uh, um, in, I think in, in, in the 90s or something, by uh, um, John Madden. And that play was very famous. It was, uh, it was called Shakespeare in Love. And, and in one of the, uh, the scenes, we have um, Shakespeare himself, uh, um, I mean, as performed by one of the characters. And he would refer to the fact that uh, Christopher Marlowe was very talented, and the fact that he even um, built uh, two of his famous plays 
on, on the inspiration that he got from uh, Christopher Moore. Um, and this is, of course, imaginary, but it would tell you a great deal about the, the great talent that Christopher Marlowe used to have. Um, again, um, in, in the quote that we're talking about from the film, you, uh, we have a reference to this idea uh, that Christopher Marlowe um, um, you know, died untimely. Uh, and this is perhaps uh, one reason why he he got the um, the um, the fame that he got. So it's it's not simply because he was talented, and of course he was. It's also because of uh, of this early death that everybody was uh, wondering about. Um, again. Uh, during the time, there, there is going to be a great deal of talk about Christopher Marlowe. And unfortunately, most of the accounts during the time are, uh, uh, are you know, or, uh, are negative accounts. Uh, people are saying bad stuff and they would uh, um, talk about uh, Marlowe as being, um, you know, when you describe somebody as uh, perhaps naughty, as uh, um, you know, um, bad um, in behavior, uh, at one point he would be taken to court for uh, you know fighting with uh, at the police. At uh, at another, they would refer to him as uh, being uh, you know. Uh, a spy, a government spy. So again, we're not talking about the literary talent that would uh, um, be living a peaceful type of life. No, we're having somebody who um, who picks up fights um, uh, on, on perhaps a daily basis or something. Uh, again, it's it's not only about you know, picking up fights and being a macho and uh, uh, being um, untoward in his behavior. There is also the idea uh, that he was extreme in his views. The fact that uh, there, and there was a reference to the fact that he was uh, challenging the orthodoxies of the time. And orthodoxy is what people in a society came to agree on. Orthodoxy, you have religious orthodoxies, uh, I mean, in a country, people uh, all believe uh, in a certain religion. Um, when it comes to politics, they, they have their own system of uh, perhaps government. Uh, they have their own traditions and everything. So these are called orthodoxies. OK, so ideas that people have agreed on for hundreds and perhaps thousands of years. Um, when Christopher Marlowe came, he uh, started to challenge some of these orthodoxies. When it comes to religion, he would challenge uh, the uh, religious orthodoxies of the time. When it comes to uh, culture and traditions, he would also challenge the traditions and he wouldn't accept them. Um, again, that would be what would cause problems for him. We have people would accuse him when it comes to religious um, uh, orthodoxies. Uh, people would accuse him of being uh, perhaps uh, um, as being an atheist. An atheist is somebody who does not believe in God. And they would say, um, listen, this guy is uh, is a threat. Um, and of course, he would be taken to court for holding such ideas. And those ideas are what we call non-conformist ideas. So conformity is when you conform to the rules and regulations of your society. OK, so they believe in a certain religion and you also believe in, in, in the same religion. 
they hold uh, um, a number of traditions very dear and near to their hearts. You also hold those uh, traditions and you respect uh, and show regard for them. OK, so he wasn't that kind of people. Uh, when it comes to religion, he would say, no, uh, I don't agree. Um, um, uh, I have doubts. Uh, I don't I don't like this idea. Um, to the extent that they started to uh, accuse him of holding monstrous opinions. Monstrous, you know, you know what a monster is, right? Um, so again, on, on account of being uh, um, the atheist that everybody was accusing him of, uh, somebody who does not believe in God, somebody who is challenging Christianity, uh, is uh, um, uh, calling the founder of Christianity, Jesus Christ, he would co call him names and all these kinds of things. This is, of course, bad, and it would affect uh, his uh, reputation a great deal. To the extent that when, when he uh, dies, when he gets killed, um, lots of people from the church would comment on, on that saying that uh, this guy I mean, deserved what happened to him. It was a, a, a divine retribution, if you like. It was a, a, a punishment method out by God for his transgression. Transgression means that you go against the established norms and the established uh, uh, traditions, whether these traditions are religious traditions or social norms. But this is uh, what exactly happened to him. He used to mock religion. He would refer to Christ um, in very uh, using bad terms. Uh, and uh, um, um, again, the, this is going to take away from uh, his good reputation and he would be uh, um, you know, um, accused of being, um, like I said, an atheist, somebody who is transgressing against religion. Uh, again, uh, does it mean that it was all bad and it was all negative about him? Uh, amidst all, all these kinds of uh, bad reviews, you also had people who uh, recognized his talent, the people who could tell that uh, Christopher Marlowe, for all uh, what he is doing, he was a great, uh, a great talent. And one of them happens to be a dramatist by the name of George Peel. George Peel uh, used to call uh, Christopher Marlowe the muses darling. You know, muses are, according to Greek uh, mythology, the muses are um, those imaginary creatures, mythical creatures that would give inspiration to the poet, any poet. Um, so if you are the muses darling, it means that uh, the muses favor you. Uh, it means that you write excellent poetry because of the talent that you have. Where do you get this talent? You get this talent from the muses uh, who uh, are obviously in love with you. Again, this is an indication that he was exceptionally talented. Uh, it's exactly like when I say for in, in our uh, culture, we would say that uh, Abu Taib al-Mutanabbi is the muse's darling because of how excellent he is in, in poetry. Um, again, another poet, uh, Thomas, uh, or another playwright rather, uh, Thomas Haywood, he would describe uh, uh, Christopher Marlowe in 1633 as the best of poets in that age. Again, um, you, you'll have lots of people talk about him in, 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 in a bad way, and obviously whatever is bad uh, sometimes um, outweighs whatever is good. And um, you know, uh, people uh, when he dies would talk about him in negative terms. And they would also refer to the fact that he was a, a rule breaker who would challenge religious, political, or sexual orthodoxies. Um, 
and they would uh, look at uh, some of his plays as representation of just that. One of them happens to be, of course, uh, Dr. Faustus, where we were going to have a challenge uh, um, and uh, an attack on, on traditional orthodoxies, and one of them happens to be uh, religious orthodoxies. The fact that uh, Dr. Faust is, is going to strike a deal with the devil, and this is of course challenging relig uh, religious sensitivities and sensibilities. Um, uh, again, over time, um, we will have this bad reputation, astonished reputation, until we come uh, to the 19th century. And when we come to the 19th century, and with the establishment of, the, um, of English studies as a major, as a big discipline, and a distinct academic discipline, um, uh, people are going to study Marlowe, and uh, he is going to be, to start to be given some credits. So uh, um, they are going to divorce um, him completely from his background. They they would say, for example, well, um, in in his private life, he would um, we would accept that he does whatever he wants to. Uh, but we we shouldn't deny uh, him the talents that. He has. So they acknowledged his talents. And this was also a time, and I'm talking about the 19th century, um, and I were talking about early and even late 19th century. Early 19th century means that we're talking about the period of the Romantics. And the Romantics were a number of poets who uh, we're challenging, we're also challenging the, the artistic and the literary orthodoxies and traditions of the time. And some of them were very strange in their behavior, and people started to like them. Uh, this was in the 19th century. We have people like Shelley. Shelley was a very famous poet, and he, he also uh, was exhibiting doubts and he was also challenging uh, religion and religious orthodoxies, and people were fine with him. You also have uh, Lord Byron. Lord Byron was also a very famous romantic poet, and he uh, and he has those uh, questionable, um, you know, um, ideas about him and uh, about his behavior, personal behavior, and he was also fine uh, among people. So um, uh, Christopher Marlowe, when uh, people get to know about him in the 19th century, they would adopt the same attitudes towards him. They would separate his individual personal life from his literary talent, and they would end up saying that he is um, exceptional, that he, uh, he was one of a kind, and they would treat him uh, based on that not uh, on the fact that he was a machu, not uh, not based on the fact that he was um, an atheist. They would say, no, I mean, that's, uh, it doesn't make any difference for us. We're focusing on the talent, and the guy uh, enjoyed tremendous talent. Again, um, Christopher Marlowe, because of his history, before he was not part of the ten, uh, the canon. I spoke about the canon before, and I said the canon is um, a list of approved writers and uh, you know works. Uh, if you're part of a can of the canon as a writer, it means that uh, people recognize you and they would read you and they would buy your books. If you're not part of the canon, uh, it means uh, the likelihood that you get accepted and you get approved is very slim and is very low. Um, again, because of the bad reputation that he had over the years, Christopher Marlowe was not part of the canon. Uh, of course, Shakespeare was on top of the canon. In the 19th century, when people started to separate whatever is personal from whatever 
is creative and uh, whatever it is uh, about talent, uh, he came to his own and he was integrated into the literary canon. This was in the 19th century, uh, exactly like um, Shelley. Like I said, Shelley was a romantic poet who was, uh, who was an avowed atheist. And of course, like Lord Byron, who was also, uh, um, you know, scandalized more than once because of his sexual behavior and stuff. Again, this was a time in the 19th century where there was this big separation between your personal life as a writer and your talent as a writer. They would separate, and if if you're uh, uh, enormously, enormously talented, they would uh, um, focus on this part. Um, so this is as far as Christopher Marlowe's uh, biography is concerned. Now we're moving to Dr. Faustus. And like I said, Dr. Faustus happens to be one of his best plays. Again, we're featuring Dr. Faustus and not the other plays because of the similarities and the correspondence between uh, the two. Dr. Faustus, the creation, and uh, Christopher Marlowe, the creator and the author. Um, how much is much when it comes to the similarities? We have a great deal of similarities in terms of the upbringing, the fact that the two of them were poor. Uh, the fact that the, the two of them were exceptional, one, one of them was exceptional in science, Dr. Faustus, while Christopher Marlowe was exceptional in, in the arts and in literature. Um, again, um, one uh, such similarity would be the idea that they are not holding or they are, they are not ha having orthodox ideas. They would challenge orthodox uh, conformist ideas. They are described as non-conformist. Non non-conformist, like I said, means that they don't follow and, ob uh, and obey the, uh, the the rules and regulations and the traditions of the time. They have their own uh, mind uh, and they think about everything. They don't inherit uh, ideas and theories. They would challenge ideas and theories and they would say, no, uh, we accept this and we don't accept it. Uh, again, in this in this sense, they are non-conformist and non-conformity in, in societies is a big deal. If you are non-conformist, non it means that you're holding uh, views and opinions um, that uh, that are not shared by a lot of people in society. And um, the next thing you know is that people are uh, kind of uh, casting doubts on, on, on your behavior and your every move. They may mis misconstrue your uh, ideas and they would uh, accuse you uh, of being um, an atheist. And they would uh, even file uh, law suits against you. So Dr. Faustus was such and Christopher Marlowe was such. Again, uh, people who have non-conformist views uh, also ha have our own radical beliefs. And radical beliefs are not just other beliefs, I mean, beliefs that would turn the society on, on its head. Uh, is the society ready for that? Uh, of course not. So who is going to win eventually? The individual or the society? A society that, that is made up of millions of people who hold the same beliefs or an individual who is having non-conformist radical beliefs? Of course, the society. So what happens to this individual? Um, you know, normally um, he is cast off. He is um, sometimes uh, even asked to um, to leave the country sometimes it gets as bad and as nasty as uh, um, having him killed eventually or thrown yeah, into threatened prison. Threatened a lot too. Yes, I, he, I mean for for conformist society, he or she is considered a threat, a societal threat that should be uh, gotten rid of once and for all. 
Uh, again, Dr. Faust is, uh, is the most uh, famous of Marlowe's plays. And it's simply about uh, its hero who sells his soul to the devil in return for 24 years of power uh, and pleasure. Uh, again, as you can see, we have a rebellious protagonist or hero. And uh, does this rebellious protagonist or hero remind us of somebody? Of course, he reminds us of Marlu. Uh, okay, so uh, the question uh, pops up, why? Why would Marlu, of all the plays that he had, why did he choose uh, Dr. Faustus to base his play uh, upon? Obviously, uh, the play is not an original play. Um, no, not original in the sense that he took the, the, the plot of his play, Dr. Faustus, from uh, another play or uh, from a book, uh, and it was called The History of the Damnable Life and Deserved Death of Dr. Uh, John Faustus. And this, this was um, a German book, so he had it uh, in translation, and he got inspired by the story. And he wrote, and he based his play on this German book. Um, again, why would he, of all the books uh, that were available at the time, why did he ch choose this story? Again, because of perhaps the ideas that the book holds, the fact that he sees a correspondence between what he thinks and what in the book is about. Uh, he sees correspondence and battles between himself and the protagonist of the book. Relatable. Ah, yes, uh, it was very relatable uh, to him. Yeah, and the fact that he himself was uh, a rebellious uh, individual who would uh, who wouldn't settle for easy solutions and easy answers. Uh, yes, and yes, since, yes. He was, uh, since uh, he didn't uh, worship God or anything, he also related to uh, having a deal with the devil. Yeah, that this is uh, going to come in, yes. Uh, again, the idea, uh, what's your name? Pascal. Pascal, yes. Uh, like Pascal is saying that the, there is also this battles, um, Marlow uh, did not believe in God, and Dr. Faustus uh, actually uh, sold Satanist. his soul. Uh, yeah, he sold his soul to Satan. So they are uh, pretty much similar. Uh, again, um, the, the question that we would be uh, all the time concerning ourselves with would be uh, whether Dr. Faustus was presented to give a moral lesson or to uh, uh, perhaps confirm and reinforce what people already know about Dr. Faust, uh, about Christopher Marlowe as a maverick uh, um, artist uh, who would settle, uh, who wouldn't settle for easy answers. So this would be our main concern. We're trying to prove whether, uh, um, you know, Dr. Faustus was a replica or a copy of Marlowe or um, um, was, was it written uh, because uh, perhaps Marlowe wanted to say to give people a moral lesson. And that would bring us to the idea of whether the play is um, a morality play or a tragedy. If it's a morality play, it means that he, he um, Christopher Marlowe, is trying to give, uh, you know, people, uh, is trying to warn people uh, against the falling into, into the trap of asking too much, of going beyond uh, uh, their limits, um, you know, having vaulting ambition, not stopping at uh, at anything in order to achieve uh, their ambition. It, it can be, a, this, this can be an interpretation. And the other interpretation would be that he, uh, Marlu was, uh, uh, was admiring 
uh, the 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 figure of the uh, the rebel or the rebellious uh, people who are rebellious uh, people who do not stop at anything people who would challenge uh, existing orthodoxies so, uh, this is going to be our main concern um if if we move down we'll we'll talk about the play i we're 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 now moving from the man to his creation we're now focused more than ever on the play um, and the play uh, of course is dr faustus and we're we're reading dr faustus as uh, a renaissance play so renaissance uh, 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 is a term and it is full of ideas it's pregnant with ideas that we need to un unpack so uh, renaissance means uh, if you're familiar with french uh, you have the verb, I think, rene or something, uh, uh, where it means uh, to give birth again or uh, revive, uh, re rebirth. So what is it that they were trying to revive and show, uh, uh, you know, renewed interest? And it was the classical works of uh, ancient um, Greeks and Romans. Um, ancient Greeks and Romans had a big civilization and it has different aspects. It was a material civilization where you would have architecture, you have engineering and science, and it, would, it was also um, an artistic civilization where you have interest in music, you have interest in poetry, um, and you also have interest in uh, drama and theater. Uh, so again, uh, um, so uh, we're saying that this is a revival or um, a renewed interest. So revival means that at one point, uh, these kinds of learnings came to an end. People were not interested in them, right? Yeah, this, uh, yeah. this is uh, actually what happened dur during the Middle Ages. So, or the medieval period. The medieval period or the Middle uh, Ages are... Uh, the times between, uh, or the gap, actually the gap between ancient Rome and ancient Greece and the early modern age. So there was a gap in the middle uh, where Europe uh, was totally in the dark in terms of civilization. This is, by the way, uh, was the time when the, uh, the uh, Arab civilization was in full swing. So it's ironic that when they were uh, um, uncivilized, uh, we were in 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 our uh, you know in our peak in terms of civilization and everything. <coughs> I'm sorry. So during the Middle Ages, there was no civilization, <clears throat> there was no science, and the church was reigning supreme. Everything was interpreted. Uh, through religious eyes. Uh, of course, religion is good and everything, but there is obviously more to life than just religion. So the focus in the Middle Ages was on the religious interpretation of everything. Again, uh, they wouldn't um, allow people to perhaps experiment and they would say, no, this is against religion. Uh, they wouldn't en engage in scientific, um, you know, experimentations. Uh, no, this is not accepted. All uh, people would do in the Middle Ages would uh, obey clergy people or the people of the church, and the people of the church would govern and control everything, even the government itself. So this was not a time where you can have... Um, uh, advancement and development in science and in the arts. That's why they aptly call it uh, the uh, I mean the dark ages. Okay, so we're we're having uh, this period behind us, and now we are in the Renaissance. And by now, you know what is being revived. So uh, the uh, people of the Renaissance would go. They would jump so that they would not meet the Middle Ages. They would go uh, beyond the Middle Ages or before the Middle Ages, which is um, the Greeks and the Romans. They would revive interest in their work. 
they would read their work and they would apply their sciences and everything. So this is called the uh, Renaissance, where we have a shift from God to man, from uh, you know religion to science and the arts. So. And the shift is from the Middle Ages, where uh, the focus is on religion, to the early modern period, or the Renaissance, where the focus is on science and the arts. Okay. Um, the focus is now is on man. There is this absolute belief in man, like there was this absolute belief in religion and in God in the Middle Ages. So the table are now turned. So instead of religion, we now have science and the arts. OK, and instead of this absolute belief in, in, in God, there is this absolute belief in man, capital M. And they would say that man has potential and man can do everything. Nothing should stop or stop uh, should stop him or her for that matter. So if you have an atmosphere like this, you wouldn't uh, uh, perhaps be surprised when you, you would have people like Dr. Faustus and Christopher Marlowe who believe who, who have absolute trust and confidence in man. They have this confidence uh, um, and this trust and, and this absolute belief that man can work wonders. OK, so to come and tell them, listen, there is a limit for everything, they would say no. Thank you. Uh, we don't believe in limits. We're human beings. We have human potential that would go beyond any and everything. So what do you expect them to do? You expect Dr. Faustus to, uh, I mean, he would master all the sciences of the earth. He would do, uh, you know, uh, religion, uh, law, medicine, everything. He would read in everything and he would master everything. Okay, typical of the age, he would at one point he would say, listen, I mastered everything. Um, and, and I'm not satisfied. I, I'm a human being who has limitless uh, and endless ambition. What's next? Do you have something next? Yeah, they would tell him, listen, there is magic. And magic can take you to heights you never imagine or dream of. You would say, ah, okay, why not? They would tell him, no, this is against religion. You would tell them, no, nothing is, uh, um, I mean, we don't, we don't, I don't believe that uh, there is, uh, the, the, there should be limits set to human potential. And he would take up magic, he would conjure up magic in order to go beyond uh, whatever other people are considering his limits. Is that good? Is that bad? This is one of the questions that we would be asking. Is Marlu doing that in order to tell us, look, Dr. Faustus is doing that and this is bad? Perhaps. Perhaps he's doing it and he's saying, yeah, look, Dr. Faustus is the representation of the limitless human being who wouldn't stop at anything. So at the end of the play, we need to come up with this assessment and decide whether Dr. Faustus is a representation of Marlu who, who wouldn't stop at anything to achieve his ambitions or would be a morality play uh, where uh, Dr. Faustus is presented as an example of those who go beyond their limits and they, of course, they meet their deserved end, tragic end. OK, so as you can see, this is a challenging read. The play is difficult, difficult not in, 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 in terms of, you know, uh, in terms of language and 
it's uh, difficult in terms of the ideas uh, uh, present. Now, of course, there is a, a measure of difficulty when it comes to the vocabulary, because this is not uh, 21st century English. This is uh, the English of the early modern period where the vocab is obviously so different, but we can manage somehow. Uh, the play is also written, not written in conventional poetry. It's written in what we call plant verse or free verse. Uh, again, why would uh, uh, Christopher Marley use plant verse, which is obviously not conventional uh, and not a conventional type of verse? This is also uh, would reflect his personality. The fact that he wouldn't settle for conventional things. He would even challenge artistic and poetic uh, orthodoxies uh, and uh, um, the end result is that you're having plank verbs, not conventional poetry. Uh, <clears throat> uh, again, um, uh, using blank verse would also point to his personality and also to his free spirit. Blank verse is free verse and it's uh, Marlowe and his story is about freedom, the freedom of the individual to do whatever he wants to do. So this is all about uh, blank verse. We have already covered that. Do you, do you have any questions so far? No, doctor. OK, so am I complicating things? No, everything. Thank you, doctor. You know, sometimes I do. <laughs> okay. So reading Dr. Faust, and uh, uh, of course you're familiar with the uh, uh, the uh, the structure and the organization of the different genres. If we're talking about a novel, you of course know that novels are divided into chapters, right? If we talk about plays, uh, you know of course that plays are divided into acts. And the acts are divided into scenes. You're familiar with that, right? Yeah. OK, good. So uh, we're, we're reading the, the play. Um, actually, we're not reading every single word. Uh, we're, we're reading, you know, um, you know, significant parts of the play. Things that would uh, either confirm our perceptions and ideas about Marlowe and about Dr. Faustus, or things that would also challenge our ideas about them. So this is act one and this is one. Yet art thou still but Faustus and a man. Uh, perhaps you need to, uh, this is the kind of close reading that I'm talking about. This can be, for example, a question where you, are, you have a line li like this and this line is obviously taken from the play. Um, of course, you read the play, you would know that where this happens in the play and what came before and what come, came after and the significance of the line. So because I have the, read the play over the years so many times, I know where to locate this line in the play and how to relate it to what comes before and what comes after. Uh, uh, perhaps before I do that, I, I would like to also share with you the fact that this is, uh, we have this contention of whether the play, it's a play, whether the play is a morality play or a tragedy, okay? Um, so what's a morality play? So uh, a morality plays is obviously, or are not, uh, they don't be belong to the early modern age. They don't belong to the uh, Renaissance. They are remnants of the Middle Ages. Again, why would uh, uh, people in the Middle Age use the morality play uh, technique? It's simply because uh, people at the time were not uh, educated in the Middle Ages. And the, the church had such a hold on people and their minds. So like I said, the church was in full control. 
and the church wanted to uh, perhaps educate people about their religion. Uh, they wanted people to obey God and to behave in a certain way within the parameters of religion. So they cannot give them books because people are not educated. So in this case, they, they would uh, um, adopt drama or uh, plays. They would say that the plays are the in the best form and the, the, the best platform through which we can give and communicate our, idea, our ideas to lay people. Lay people are people who are not, um, you know, well educated in a field. So people were not, uh, were lay people when it comes to religion. So they wanted to send them religious messages. Um, no books. We're, we're talking also about the time when uh, even the, the printing uh, press uh, was not invented. Again, the best form would be the theater, drama, where uh, uh, writers would write plays and they would call these plays or those plays morality plays. And as you can see it, uh, I mean, if you unpack the phrase, it's morality play or morality plays. So these were plays where morality was at the core of the play. Morality, of course, is like religion. Do, do, do this and don't do that. Don't steal. This is morality, right? Don't uh, cheat. This is uh, moral, right? Don't uh, perhaps... Uh, drink and drink wine and all these kinds of this is morality. So the focus with morality plays would be on giving people religious and moral lessons uh, as what to do and what not to do. Okay. So morality plays were the product of the Middle Ages. Um, okay, so in terms of features, uh, a morality play would have, um, you normally have embodiments of abstract ideas. The personification of ideas, the idea of good, the idea of evil, the idea uh, um, of what, uh, generosity, uh, jealousy, okay, so they would have people, uh, you know, uh, taking up the rules of these different uh, abstract ideas. So you would have a character playing uh, um, um, good or good deeds, and you ha would have another character playing uh, the character of bad deeds. You would have a third playing the role of evil, a fourth playing generosity, and so on and so forth. Again, uh, they, uh, the playwrights and the writers at the time would make sure that the good would overcome the evil or the good would win over the evil. This is the moral lesson that you get out of the play. Um, so this was in the Middle Ages. Um, um, when we come to the early modern age, we, we wouldn't think that we would need morality plays anymore because people are now more educated. They don't need other people to play the roles of these different abstractions and come to them and tell them, yeah, this is good or bad. They, uh, this was the time where um, instead of worshipping God, there is this worship of man and his potential. So morality plays would, would not work because they are uh, purely religious, uh, purely moral, and uh, people in the early modern age believe in other things other than um, religion. They would believe in science. Again, when you look at Dr. Faustus, which is a product of the Renaissance, which is 
a product of the early modern age, which it's, with, with its focus on science, on the arts, you would get amazed and surprised. Why? And that would also bring us to the idea of, uh, of uh, perhaps Marlu was trying to give us a moral lesson. Perhaps Marlu wasn't uh, bad after all in the moral, uh, in the traditional sense. Okay, so when you look at Dr. Faustus, you would also look at it as a morality play. Morality play in the sense that you also have abstract ideas and those abstract ideas are given human embodiment. Uh, you would have the character or the characters of the good and the evil angels. When you say angels, do we have angels in the early modern age where there is this absolute belief in science? Do they believe in the supernatural? Uh, this is a question that we need to ask. Why? I mean, uh, you know, obviously Marlu is not uh, um, taking it easy on us. We don't we don't know how to uh, interpret him, and we don't know how to interpret his work. Uh, morality play in the early modern age, where science is reigning supreme, where there is no such thing as supernatural belief. People don't believe in. They only believe in whatever is in, in front of their eyes. They believe in their sense experiences. Whatever I can touch, whatever I can smell, whatever I can see, okay? Other than that, so obviously supernatural stuff. We don't see angels. Do, do we see them? You see angels or you believe in them? I believe in them. You believe in them, right? I believe in them. So, Ah, so in the early uh, modern age, uh, this uh, this was strange. And, uh, we don't believe in uh, uh, the only thing that we we, we uh, uh, perhaps believe in would be the thing that we see and touch and experience. So again, um, Christopher Marlowe is making us wonder: Where do you stand? Are you an early modern guy who believe who has this absolute belief in science, or you still have those uh, smattering of religion and religious? You, you, your re religious fire is still on inside you. Okay. Um, Okay, so it's uh, the play can um, can be seen as a morality play, um, where uh, you have features of the morality play uh, in Doctor Fass, where you have the good and evil angels, the fact that they fight over the soul of Doctor Faustus. Of course, the good angel would tell him, "Stop practicing magic. Magic is against the will of God." you'll be damned uh, in the end, while the evil angel would, would say, magic is going to open up opportun windows of opportunities for you. You would have absolute power, you would have absolute pleasure and absolute everything. So they are fighting over the mind and the heart and even the soul of Faustus. So again, the good angel would warn him of the danger of arousing God's heavy wrath, and wrath means anger, by practicing black magic, while the evil angel would uh, remind him of the power uh, and the pleasure that necromancy will bring. And necromancy, of course, means magic. Again, uh, when we have uh, good and evil characters uh, featured, uh, this is an element and a characteristic of the morality plays. And the morality plays are religious plays, like we know, where you, you always have this conflict between good and evil. 
Uh, and this conflict is normally represented by supernatural figures. You would have the character of the devil, whether we're talking about Mephistopheles or Lucifer. You would have personified abstractions like the good and the evil angel and even the seven deadly sins. Um, again, typical of morality plays, you would have this didactic element. Didactic means uh, teaching or giving a lesson. So the, the play, if you consider it a morality play, it would be very didactic. Uh, what is the moral lesson that we're getting? If it's a morality play, it would be that you shouldn't go beyond your limits that you should be you should humble down you should not think of yourself as another god on earth you're only a human being okay let's go back to the statement yet art thou still but faustus and a man okay this is uh, perhaps after he finished all the sciences, He's, he mastered all the sciences. He's tried his hand with, with like I said, with re, uh, theology, which is religion. Uh, he tried his hand uh, uh, with uh, law. He tried his hand with the different sciences, medicine. Um, and he, he tells himself, yet art thou still but Fa you're still Faustus. And you are a man. You're still a human being with limits. So obviously he's talking to himself. Do you think that he's happy this way? Does it seem that he is happy? He's no. talking to himself. And this is what we call a soliloquy. Soliloquy is a dramatic technique that writers use in order to reveal to us what the main character is thinking of. So how could we know that Faustus is having thoughts about uh, himself still being a man, um, 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 and that the fact that he is not happy with what is happening? How could we know about that? It's through soliloquies, where he stands alone on the stage and he talks uh, um, um, and when he talks, of course, uh, you get to know what he's thinking of. This is called a soliloquy. <clears throat> okay. Um, so how is the, the, the play presented? The play uh, would start with what we call a prologue. A prologue is uh, some kind of introduction where you have, um, you know, people, and we normally call them the chorus. The chorus is, um, you know, in, in Greek tragedy, you would have a number of people, um, um, you know, walking into the stage every now and then in order to give the moral lesson, in order to comment on events and give a moral lesson, to highlight the, uh, the moral of the part. Um, do we have a similar thing? Yes, we have a similar thing in Dr. Faustus, we, where you have the chorus, but this, uh, the chorus in, in Faustus' play is only one character. Uh, and this character uh, would walk into, um, you know, the stage from time to time, and he would also comment on what's happening. Um, again, uh, you have the prologue, which is more or less like an introduction. And this introduction, uh, um, the, the main character is presented. The theme of the play is presented. Um, and the, the one who gives the prologue would be the chorus. At the end of the play, you have what we call a, an epilogue, which is more or less like a conclusion. Uh, where you also have the chorus also commenting on what ha has been happening and giving the moral. Uh, 
So uh, in Greek tragedy, the chorus was a group of, uh, of people, uh, whereas in Dr. Faustus and in Elizabethan drama, uh, it, it, it was only one person. Again, we said that uh, the morality plays were a product of the late Middle Ages, but it was popular, not very popular during uh, Marlowe's time. And again, uh, the fact that uh, Marlowe is uh, perhaps uh, um, using some of the elements would uh, have us think that perhaps he is trying to uh, give us a moral lesson and perhaps he is trying to warn the audience uh, of the dire consequences of uh, practicing uh, uh, black magic. Um, is it clear so far? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay, good. So, um, um, okay. So it's again, uh, we're talking about the start of the play where the court spends several lines telling the audience what the play is not about. The fact that it's not about war or love or martial heroism. Again, so it's not about any of that. Uh, um, uh, it's um, it's it's about it's bigger than that. Um, and then uh, there is going to be this engagement with Faustus and his childhood. There is going to be talk about the fact that he was born to parents base of stock. Base of stock means that they were very poor. Uh, the fact that he started uh, he went when he. Uh, was older, he studied uh, theology and divinity at the University of Wittenberg. Um, and then, of course, he distinguished himself. He was brilliant and he was awarded um, a doctorate degree when he was very young. If you compare him to other people, his age, he was uh, way uh, uh, smarter and he could, you know, land a doctorate in very early in his life. Again, what does uh, tell you about Faustus? It tells you that he was exceptional. Uh, would he uh, keep this exceptionalism? No, he would go beyond it. He would say, listen, I have perfected everything and it doesn't seem that I am happy. Do you guys have more? Yes, we have magic. Uh, can I try it? Uh, but we're warning you against, uh, you know, uh, practicing magic because obviously it's a, it's anti-religion religion and it's anti-God. He would say, listen, I am a human being in the early modern age, in the uh, Renaissance, where uh, there is absolute belief in man. Again, this is going to be considered as self-conceit. Conceit means arrogance and, and, and pride. The fact that he does, he is full of himself and he is full of intellectual pride. And this is engendered by arrogance. Uh, again, if we're talking about intellectual pride, if we're talking about self-conceit, so we are in obviously for issues and problems. Again, the, the, the chorus is going to sum everything up, even before uh, Faustus appears. He talks about, um, I mean, like I said, his uh, low origins and, and how exceptional he was. And then uh, on the way, the chorus would tell us about the fact that he is full of uh, intellectual uh, pride and that would bring about his downfall. Um, again, uh, this is uh, a literary work, and when we talk about literary work, there is going to be a, a measure of imagery. 
and figures of speech. Um, literary uh, language is obviously different from, you know, non-literary, um, from the language that we, we, we speak. The language we speak is uh, prose and it's, it's poor in imagery. Um, uh, we are practical enough not to use uh, image, and, and figurative language and imagery and all these kinds of things. But with literature, in order for literature to be appealing to people, the writers would use imagery and figures of speech. Um, at, one, at one point, uh, um, the, the chorus would refer to uh, Faust as, as swollen with, with pride and arrogance. And swollen is when you, uh, you, you, got, got, you, you get swollen if, uh, uh, you, if you hurt one of your uh, perhaps body uh, parts and uh, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. If yeah, you but this eat, one is metaphorically. Ah, yeah, this is what I'm saying. The fact that this is figurative language. Uh, and um, again, it would uh, be very appealing to the audience and it would also uh, kind of, uh, you know, the language of poetry and the language of literature is about condensation, condensation and in, in the intensification of things. Whatever other people in other genres would say in, in pages and pages, a poet or a dramatist, a dramatist would use uh, um, a phrase or a word that will sum up the whole thing. Uh, um, and this is actually what uh, Marlowe is doing here. Um, again, uh, we will have another. Uh, there is uh, always uh, uh, this talk about how self-conceited uh, um, Dr. Faustus is, uh, how uh, proud and arrogant he is. Um, and th there is going to be a time when uh, Dr. Faustus is compared to uh, um, um, an ancient and a mythical Greek uh, figure by the name of Icarus. And Icarus is somebody um, is, uh, he's a legendary or a mythical figure, of course, uh, who would uh, try to create wings and he would, uh, and those wings were made of wax and he would start to fly, but somehow when he, uh, um, he is perhaps close to the sun, what happens in the wax will, would melt and he would, uh, fall down. And of course, when he falls down, uh, he would die, right? <laughs> so, so yes. this, this is obviously an indirect, an indirect reference to the... Can we mute our mics, please? Some, somebody is... Uh, kindly mute your mic. Yeah, Pascal, Pascal, please mute your mic. Can you still see the slides or, or the book? I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, okay, so I, I was talking about Icarus, this mythical, a Greek mythical figure who uh, um, uh, invented or created uh, wings made of wax, and he started to fly with them, but somehow when he uh, approached the sun, it uh, uh, melted down, and the next thing you know is that he died, of course. He fell down and died. Um, so that image would sum up books upon books. So instead of telling you that you shouldn't do that because this is beyond your limits and beyond your capacities, because if you do that, you're going to die and blah, 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 right? So I can have a line. I can have a, a reference to something that sums up the whole idea. 
So when I say, I tell you, when I make a reference to uh, Icarus, and of course you know who Icarus is, you, you're going to establish the links between Dr. Faustus and Icarus, and you can almost tell what will happen to Dr. Faustus without me telling you uh, what will happen perhaps in Act 2 or in Act 3. Okay, so we're having a moral lesson here. Icarus created a wax, uh, a wax in wings. Okay, he flew for some time and then he fell and died. Okay, so obviously Dr. Faustus is uh, adopting the same attitude. So instead of having waxen wings, he has magic, right? So he would practice magic and magic is going to give him everything. Okay, but at one point, he would have to give his soul to the devil because uh, the devil is the only, uh, uh, you know, figure that can make magic available to him. Okay, so he's going to stri strike a deal with the magic, uh, with, with the devil, and the devil would tell him, listen, okay, I'll give you absolute everything, absolute power, absolute pleasure, uh, um, but uh, this is for 24 years. After that, you are mine, your soul is mine. So what are you going to do with my soul? I'll take it and throw, into, uh, throw it into hell. Deal? Yes, deal. So in this case, Dr. Faust is, uh, is an Icaron figure, if I can call him so. He is exactly like uh, Icarus, right? Uh, both of them, are the symbols of the overreacher. The, and the overreacher is the man who tries to exceed his own limitations and of course comes to grief uh, as a result. Not without dire consequences. He would, like Icarus, Faustus tried to mount above his reach and was punished for his presumption, for this kind of arrogance, for this kind of transgression. And heavens conspired his overthrow. So his overthrow is no more than a divine punishment or retribution. Is that clear? Yes. Yes. Yeah. There is, obviously a okay. there is obviously a difference between the end of Icarus and the end of Faust. The two of them are going to fall. Okay, but Icar we're talking, with Icarus, we're, we're talking about the time where uh, there was no religion. So his destruction is self-destruction. While with Faustus, we are talking about a world regulated by the Christian God. So the, the, the fall in the case of Faustus is meted out by God, by the intervention of God. Okay. Again, this is all the prologue. Uh, can, you, can you see this image? Can you see Icarus? He's, yes, I can. Yeah, we can. Uh, yes. Yes. yes, doctor. I mm. can see it. Okay. So after this very long prologue, where the chorus is uh, um, you know, um, controlling the scene, uh, giving us everything, uh, telling us about the uh, about Faustus and his background, comparing him to Icarus, referring to him as an overreacher. Okay, now is the time 
for Faustus. So we're going to meet Faustus and we're going to meet his first speech. Uh, again, Faustus is, where, where is Faustus? Faustus in his study, in, 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 in his own personal library, where in the, ba in the background you see uh, the books and the works of uh, great thinkers of classical antiquity, like the Greek philosopher Aristotle, the Greek medical authority Galen, and the Roman emperor uh, and jurist uh, Justinian or Justinian. Again, you're talking about the sciences of the time, the knowledge uh, of the time. Again, uh, they are in the background, which is a reference to the fact that he has perfected and mastered all of them. Again, after that, he's going to engage in uh, a soliloquy. Uh, and like I said, a soliloquy is a speech. It's more or less like a monologue, if you uh, uh, insights into what he, what his thinking mind uh, is capable of and is thinking. We get to know about his feelings, about his motives. Okay, um, and I mean, he's going to share with us the fact that he has mastered everything. Uh, the fact that he, he earned a doctorate in theology and religion. Um, the fact that he, uh, he did, um, you know, medicine and everything. But he's impatient for more knowledge. He does not, he's restless. He, he wants more. And he talks about philosophy, medicine, law and theology. And these were obviously the four main academic disciplines at the time, and he starts to dismiss them as intellectual dead end. I mean, he says, and he's not satisfied at all. Uh, until at one point he would think of magic and what magic would uh, bring him. Okay, so he dismisses all these sciences and all these disciplines, and he would simply say, yet, art thou still but Faustus and Amman. After all of that, you're still Faustus and still a man. A man in the sense that at one point you will die like everybody else. So obviously he wants to transcend his human what he sees as artificial restrictions on hum human potential. Remember, he is a product of the Renaissance. And uh, as a product of the Renaissance, he's not happy, he's not satisfied, he wants more and more and more, because he believes that uh, um, a human being is entitled uh, to more. Okay, so as you can see, his approach is humanist. It's not a divine approach where there is disbelief in the idea of human limitations. You cannot be another God on earth. This is what religion says. But as a humanist, as somebody who, who lived in, uh, uh, in the early modern age, in the Renaissance with its... Uh, voyages of exploration to the, uh, uh, I mean, the outside world, the expansion of trade routes and the colonization of the Americas. Uh, he, he believes that there is no limits. There shouldn't be any limits. OK, is that clear? Again, we're going to have this conflict within the soul and the mind of Dr. Faustus. Um, again, he has vaulting ambitions and everything, but he is again 
uh, he lives in a Christian society. Uh, he didn't declare that he was not Christian, so he still has those uh, 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 pangs of conscience. I mean, his conscience uh, tells him and takes him on guilt trips every now and then. Remember, you're Christian. What you're doing is bad. What what you're doing can cause you issues and problems. And then uh, um, comes the time when he says, no, I am a human being and I'm entitled to all uh, kinds of knowledge, all kinds of powers. I'm not going to stop at anything. This is the conflict that he has. And of course, this conflict is typical of plays. Uh, plays are at the core of any play, you have this conflict. Again, so what is it that uh, he's going to uh, uh, come to? I mean, it would eventually be the idea that he uh, would go and have this deal with, with the devil. Uh, again, the conflict is um, also given expression in the two angels that we spoke about, the evil angel and uh, um, the good angel, or the bad angel, and the good angel, who are fighting over his soul. Again, yes. you still, yes, you still have this. Yes. Uh, yes. 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 What? <laughs> okay. Uh, so uh, again, he, we have the um, um, those mixed motives. The fact that he he is not resolute, resolute in the sense that he, I mean, he's uh, kind of talking to himself about would I do it, and if I do it, he starts to talk about what is it that magic can bring him, the absolute power, you know, the absolute pleasure. Uh, the absolute knowledge that he uh, he dreams of. Um, um, after this part, we would have what we call comic relief. Because of the tensions that we have seen, uh, uh, we we need some relaxation, and this relax relaxation is normally given in in the play. There are those intervals where you have um, you know you normally have insi insignificant comic characters who walk into the play in order to give you the relief, the comic relief that you. Uh, uh, need. Uh, who is presenting or giving uh, this comic relief? We have two characters. We have Wagner and Ropen, uh, two uh, insignificant characters. And he, they would engage in a talk, uh, uh, perhaps about, uh, I mean, they would fight over uh, uh, a piece of mutton. And they would um, also uh, reenact what happened to Dr. Faustus, and they would make it seem that uh, whatever sacrifices um, Dr. Faustus is giving in order to practice magic and to have absolute power, whatever sacrifices he is giving uh, um, um, in, is in, are not uh, consistent with the reward. They, they consider absolute power and absolute pleasure as a, a shoulder of mutton. It's as if it's a piece of meat. You see, you're doing everything. You're sacrificing yourself. You're um, selling yourself to the devil and the, the end result would be 24 years of absolute power, it is correct, but in the 24 years will expire. So it's as if you're eating um, 
you know, um, a good meal, again, it's not going to stay there forever, right? Okay, are you getting the idea? So, who'd, so one of them would give his soul to the devil for a shoulder of mutton. And this is, of course, an, an irony, and this is mocking uh, Dr. Faust's um, endeavors and projects. Again, why are we having this comic scene together with the idea that it, it is a comic relief uh, for us as readers and as members of the audience, but it is also um, um, some kind of parallel. He's trying to give parallels uh, to uh, what uh, Dr. Faustus did. And he's trying to tell us that um, Whatever Faustus is doing is not consistent with the reward. The reward uh, for him would be uh, like the piece of mutton uh, that the two uh, characters are fighting over. Are you tired? Yes. Yes. Yes, 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 okay. Okay. So, uh, okay, no problem. Um, uh, perhaps we'll, we'll need an extra class before Tuesday. So let me arrange that and get back to you uh, on the Google, inshallah. Uh, until... Uh, nah, what? Where's on Monday? On Monday? We, we'll, yes. We'll, we'll see. Uh, we'll see. We'll agree on something. Uh, doctor? Uh, yes. Uh, doctor, we can talk about the decision because the decision will be or the decision we have done now. We don't know what the decision will be. I don't believe it's going to be multiple choice questions anymore. Mm -hmm. I'll check and, and get back to you. I'll check. Okay, please tell us because uh, 10 minutes for a say, it's not enough. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you, Doctor. Doctor. 20 minutes, it will be not enough. Doctor, well, this well. program rejected me and I try uh, to get in again three times. So that is no problem? No, it shouldn't be a problem, inshallah. Uh, we'll have... Uh, My we'll name have is it. Russia. Russia was. Russia, yeah. Okay, Russia, no problem. Thank okay. you, Doctor. I will end on this note and with this item, and I'll see you, inshallah, in the extra class. Assalamu alaikum. Doctor. Okay, thank you, Doctor. Yes. Uh, yes. Just, uh, I am Mahmoud Al August. I would want to ask you about uh, today, I have me and some of students received a uh, five message from Mr. Tarek. Mr. What? Mr. Mr. Khan from university. Okay. Uh, they, uh, in, they include this message. Uh, he sent uh, a code of AA 100A. What should okay. we do with this code? Uh, open, open the code and uh, use the book. Just a code, and he and he sent to us a uh, two book. Okay, it's uh, those books uh, belong to the course? No, it's, it was a story. Oh, but it's okay, Agamah, you guys have them. It's, uh, um, I mean, the books are available on the central LMS, and I think you have uh, seen them already, so just ignore the message. If, it's, uh, if it doesn't concern you, just ignore it. I didn't even receive the email, oh. so maybe... That's okay, I see them, and it, it can be by, by, by mistake or something. Okay, so okay, so. okay, you're welcome. No, no, doctor, Hello. it's not my mistake, doctor. The, this this box related to the course. Hi, Mish. 